Ultra Frontier Explorer, a new series for alwaysaround.net where we will be looking at space exploration and other extreme environments. 2015 is shaping up to be a fantastically exciting year in space exploration because we have at least three major deep space missions which promise to begin sending back groundbreaking information from worlds that have never been visited before. Of course, the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission to Comet 67P is beginning to approach the Sun, which means a number of things will begin to happen. The comet itself will become more active, making for various exciting results from the Rosetta spacecraft that is orbiting it. Also, if we're lucky, then the Sun will fall upon Philae, which as you will recall is a small lander that was dropped onto the comet um, last year. Um, which, if there's enough sun at the right angle, might wake the lander up, allowing it to begin more science work in situ. Secondly, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft will reach Pluto at the edge of our solar system in July. After travelling for 3 billion miles over the last 9 years, that's 32 times the distance between Earth and the Sun, New Horizons is now closer to Pluto than we are to the Sun. So in just a few months we can expect to see for the very first time in history close-up photos of Pluto and its system of moons, particularly its largest moon Charon. Much more immediately NASA's Dawn mission entered orbit around the dwarf planet Ceres which lies in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt itself is pretty much the boundary of the inner solar system lying as it does between Mars and Jupiter. Even though Ceres was discovered in 1801, this is the very first time a spacecraft has visited the dwarf planet, which is kind of surprising because it's the single largest body in the whole of the asteroid belt. On its own, it makes up 33% of the mass of all the objects that exist in the asteroid belt itself. Dawn's arrival at Ceres is not just a first for the dwarf planet itself, but it's a first for space exploration full stop. Because Dawn is the first spacecraft to orbit more than one celestial body during its seven and a half year mission. A couple of years ago, it spent 14 months in orbit around four Vesta. Uh, Vesta is the second largest object in the asteroid belt. However, Vesta is still a protoplanet, a unique relic from the start of the solar system. And at some point we will do an episode specifically on Vesta because Dawn found all kinds of exciting stuff at Vesta. Pretty amazing. Dawn has been able to visit two planetoids because Unlike previous deep space probes, which relied solely on slingshotting around planets to increase their velocity, Dawn has an ion engine. This in itself is sufficiently groundbreaking and interesting that we're going to do an episode just on that ion engine and how it transforms interplanetary travel for robot space probes and potentially for other forms of exploration later. Right now, Dawn is on the dark side of Ceres, so we won't be getting more visual results back until about mid-April, when once more it moves around to the light side. However, on the run in towards Ceres, we already saw much better photographs of the surface of Ceres than we ever have done before. Now, this is not to disparage previous results from, for example, the Hubble telescope. Now, Although this may not look like much, uh, perhaps looks like a quail's egg, for example, or maybe a pebble. However, what it did tell us was that Ceres is rounded, which is to say it's in what's called hydrostatic equilibrium, which means its own gravity forces it into a regular spheroidal or ellipsoidal shape. 
We also knew that Surrey's is 950 kilometres or 590 miles in diameter and that it orbits at roughly between 2.5 to 2.9 times further away from the Sun than the Earth does. We also know from observations by the Herschel telescope back in January 2014 of water vapour plumes arising from Ceres that there is at least some water in the composition of Ceres. In fact, we know there's quite a lot on account of its mass and density. So Ceres is a differentiated planet, which means it has an internal rocky core covered by an icy mantle and then overlaying that a crust of what is thought to be clay-type minerals, presumably left behind um, after the sublimation of ice at the surface. Just to give you a bit of an idea of the scale of Ceres, if you were able to see Ceres in the sky next to Earth's moon, uh, as you'll see in this picture here, it's roughly three and a half times smaller in diameter than the moon. In terms of mass, it's about 1 80th of the mass of our moon. Um, of course, our moon is comprised almost completely of rock. Um, what, which, what this adds up to is that gravity on the surface of Ceres is about 1 6th of the gravity on the moon, which in turn is about 1 6th of the gravity on Earth. So we know that 6 times 6 is 36. The gravity on the surface of Ceres is about 1 36th of the gravity on the surface of the Earth. Which means that roughly speaking, on the surface of Ceres, it would feel like I weigh about 5 pounds. Even as dawn approached Ceres, it was already sending back the most amazing photographs of this dwarf planet that we've ever seen. Very quickly, we were able to see surface features that we might expect, such as craters, and yet, very unexpectedly, a series of bright spots appear on the surface of Ceres. In particular, there's one, what was initially thought to be one bright spot, but later resolved in two bright spots very close together that have a very, very high um, level of reflection, or what is technically referred to as a high albedo. Now, there are a number of theories as to what these bright spots might be. They could be areas where meteors have struck the surface of Ceres, blasting away the covering of clay minerals that forms the crust and exposing the ice beneath. And or where that ice has then sublimated away, leaving behind deposits of highly reflective salts. Or they could be areas of active water volcanism, which is to say areas where warmer water or icy slush is actually pushing up through the icy mantle of Ceres to the surface. Now, if it does turn out to be water volcanism, this is tremendously exciting for a number of reasons. First of all, if there is water volcanism on Ceres, there must be heat inside Ceres. There are a few possible sources for internal heat in Ceres. One might be the decay of radioactive isotopes that might remain in the rocky core of Ceres from its formation billions of years ago at the start of the solar system. However, the vast majority of isotopes have probably decayed away to if not zero, a very low level of radioactivity. Another source of internal heat in Ceres might come from tidal forces flexing the planet. These tidal forces would come from the gravity of Jupiter and the Sun interacting. Now, although Ceres is quite a distance from Jupiter, Jupiter does have a gravitational influence on the asteroid belt. For example, there are four what are called Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt where we would expect to find more asteroids except for the resonant gravitational influence of Jupiter. A third possibility might be chemical reactions between the rocky core of Ceres and the surrounding layer of water slash water ice. By analogy with processes on Earth, specifically the processes that create the lost city 
hydrothermal vent systems underneath the Atlantic Ocean. What happens there is that exposed peridotite rock reacts with seawater to create hydrogen, methane and to release heat. Typically these so-called cold hydrothermal vent systems are between 40 to 90 degrees Celsius, plenty warm enough to create an upwelling plume of water that could force its way up through the icy mantle and out through the surface of the crust, giving us our water volcano. Now depending on whatever active chemistry is or is not happening within Ceres, if it is something along the lines of um, cold hydrothermal vent systems that we have on Earth, we might see large structures created by these chemical processes. On Earth, the cold hydrothermal vent system of the Lost City on the Atlantis Massif, which is an undersea mountain system, um, forms enormous 30-odd metre high towers of calcium carbonate rock. What's more is that the Lost City hydrothermal vent system supports life. The hydrogen and methane emitted from these chemical processes provides certain archaea microorganisms with the metabolic basis that they need to survive. And there is then a community of uh, amphipods and ostracods, which are sort of small sea creatures, that then live on, live on those archaea. So if there is a similar kind of chemistry to Earth's cold hydrothermal vent systems, happening inside Ceres, potentially this could support life. Now, you might say that even with these geochemical processes that I'm talking about, there's just not enough energy there to drive the evolution of life on Ceres independently. Well, maybe, maybe not. But there's another way that life might have ended up on Ceres. During the billions of years during which we know there's been life on Earth, Earth has been hit several times by truly enormous meteorite impacts, big enough that certainly in the case of the Chicxulub impactor, which was the uh, meteorite that killed the dinosaurs, that thousands of tons of rock from Earth have been blasted off the planet into various orbits around the solar system. And computer modeling shows that those rocks will eventually have impacted on other planets and planetoids. For example, as far out as Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. So it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility that a bunch of Earth rocks could have ended up on Ceres many millions of years ago. And given that we know that bacteria exist and live inside rock on Earth, what's called slow life, and furthermore, that we know that some bacteria also form spores that can survive for millions of years and indeed will survive exposure to the hard vacuum of space. It's not beyond possibility that life has been seeded on Ceres by rocks from Earth. So suppose, for the sake of argument, we do have this kind of cold hydrothermal vent type chemistry happening on Ceres. Suppose that we do have large numbers of microorganisms living on this source of chemical energy. Would we see any trace of them from orbit? That's a good question. And my response to this is, well, can we see very small organisms or the results of very small organisms from Earth orbit on Earth? And the answer is an emphatic, yes, we can. Here is a picture of the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is 2,000 kilometers long and it is created by tiny coral polyps, which are little animals that are only a couple of millimeters long. Here's a picture of the Bahama Banks. This is an entire system of islands and it is basically built of limestone. Limestone that is about four and a half kilometers thick. The limestone of the Bahama Banks has built up over millions of years through the action of coral polyps and also foraminiferans. Try saying that in a hurry. 
Unlike the ecology of the lost city hydrothermal vent system, which depends on geochemical energy, ultimately the limestone of the Bahama Banks depends on energy from sunlight. Basically, dust from the Sahara Desert is blown by the prevailing winds across the Atlantic and it carries mineral nutrients. When these fall into the sea around the Bahamas, phytoplankton are fertilized and they are able to grow and make use of the sunlight. Then the coral polyps and the foraminiferans eat the phytoplankton and lay down the calcium carbonate, which is limestone. This happens over millions and millions of years and gives us kilometers thick limestone, which can be easily seen from space. So it's not completely off the wall to suppose that there might just be some life on Ceres and that this life might have had a big enough effect on the planet that we might see some sign of it from orbit. So perhaps in April, when Dawn begins to send back closer photographs, we might find that we're not alone in the solar system and that there is other life out there.